সবাইকে শুভেচ্ছা জানিয়ে আজকে আমাদের আলোচনা শুরু করছি প্রগতির যাত্রী এবং ওয়াশিংটন ডিসি ভিত্তিক জার্নাল নাগরিকের উদ্যোগে আজকের এই আয়োজন আজকের আয়োজনে আমাদের সাথে থাকছেন বিশিষ্ট অর্থনীতিবিদ অধ্যাপক রেহমান সোবাহান উনি আলোচনা করবেন উনার উনিশশো সালে যে প্রকাশিত বই এক্সটার্নাল ডিপেন্ডেন্স অ্যান্ড ইকোনমিক ডেভেলপমেন্ট থিওরি অ্যান্ড প্র্যাকটিসের উপরে তার সেই সময়কার সাথে মিলিয়ে এবং বর্তমান পরিস্থিতির সাথে মিলিয়ে প্রগতি জাতীয় নাগরিকের পক্ষ থেকে আমি উৎপল দত্ত আপনাদের সবাইকে শুভেচ্ছা জানাচ্ছি যারা শুনছেন আমাদের সাথে এই জুমে এবং যারা ফেসবুকে পৃথিবীর বিভিন্ন প্রান্ত থেকে যুক্ত হয়েছেন সবাইকে শুভেচ্ছা জানাচ্ছি আপনারা যারা পরে দেখতে চাইবেন তাদের জন্য আমাদের এই অনুষ্ঠানটি আমরা ইউটিউবেও আমরা আপলোড করব সেখানেও আপনারা দেখতে পারেন পরবর্তীতে এখন ফেসবুকে আপনারা ফেসবুকেও আপনারা প্রগতির যাত্রী ডট কম আমাদের যে ফেসবুক পেজ আছে সেখানেও আপনারা আমাদের এই অনুষ্ঠান দেখতে পারবেন তো আমি খুব বেশি কথা বলতে চাই না আমি প্রফেসর রেহমান সোহানকে আমাদের আজকের এই অনুষ্ঠানে স্বাগত জানাচ্ছি ওনার উপস্থিতি নিশ্চয়ই আমাদের এই আলোচনাকে অনেক অনেক বেশি সমৃদ্ধ করবে আমরা সবাই ঋদ্ধ হব ওনার আলোচনায় তো আমি এই মুহূর্তে আমাদের নাগরিকের প্রধান সম্পাদক ডক্টর মহসিন সিদ্দিকির কাছে যেতে চাই উনি একটা ছোট্ট ইন্ট্রোডাকশন দিয়ে আমাদের আজকের এই আলোচনা শুরু করবেন তার আগে একটা কথা বলে রাখতে চাই আমাদের এই আলোচনা এক ঘন্টা থেকে দেড় ঘন্টার মধ্যে আমরা শেষ করতে চাই আপনারা যারা প্রশ্ন করতে চাইবেন কিংবা কোনো কমেন্ট করতে চাইবেন আমি আশা করি চ্যাট বক্সে যদি আপনারা দিয়ে দেন সেটা প্রফেসর রেহমান সোহানের কাছে আমরা পৌঁছে দিতে পারবো এবং সেটাই সেভাবেই আমরা এই আলোচনাটাকে এগিয়ে নিতে পারবো অথবা কেউ যদি খুব জরুরি ভিত্তিক কিছু একটা বলতে চান ওনার আলোচনার পরে একটু আমাদের নক করলে আমরা সেটা হয়তো চেষ্টা করব সময়ের সাথে মিলিয়ে ওনাকে কথা বলতে দেওয়ার জন্য তো ধন্যবাদ সবাইকে আমি ডক্টর মহসিন সিদ্দিকে আহ্বান করছি সূত্র আলোচনার সূত্রপাত করার জন্য ডক্টর মহসিন সিদ্দিক My name is Mohsin Siddiq. I'm calling for, I'm talking from outside of Washington, D.C. Possibly one of the targets of the increase of thermonuclear war breaks out. So we are, we are trying to you know, sort of take it as normal as we can under the circumstances. Now, I am supposed to be introduced to Professor Rahman Subhan, but I will make the assumption that the audience here and outside are well aware of me. I want to take the opportunity to focus on what I think is his most important contribution creation of the Center for Policy Dialogue. Among Wall Street tanks, CPD may not be unique, but for Bangladesh, it is an essential institution. Such institutions that encourage this discourse not on, not on the service of the individual, but for the nation and its people are essential for democracy. I realize that it is not an easy task when you have to depend on the vagaries of policy priorities or funding entities. I know CPD intends to, but I hope it will hard, try harder to find ways to include actual working people in its dialogue. With that, I hand it over to Professor Ravan Sova for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohsin. Thank you very much for your introduction. We are going to talk about the Bangla and English language. We are going to talk about the Bangla and the English language. We are going to talk about the Bangla and the English language. We are going to talk about the Bangla and the English language. যে কোনো ভাষাতেই আমরা দুটো ভাষাতেই আমরা এই আলোচনাটা চালিয়ে যেতে পারবো বলে আমি আশা করছি আমি এই মুহূর্তে প্রফেসর রেহমান সোবানকে সবিনে অনুরোধ করছি ওনার আলোচনা শুরু করার জন্য প্রফেসর রেহমান সোবান প্লিজ স্যার প্রফেসর রেহমান সোবান বিসাইডস Can you call him, uh, Mohsin Bhai, or uh, messenger, yeah. messenger or telephone? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
I don't know that I have his phone number. Though. WhatsApp or messenger. Maybe. But, but someone from Bangladesh can call him actually. <laughs> I, yeah, I can somebody so. from Bangladesh give him a call, please? <laughs> Akash, are you there? Akash, well, if Bangladesh now continues as Spanish speaking, looks like. <coughs> Mustafa, is it to phone call? Okay. Yeah, Mustafa. Akash has vanished also the way I'm so I'm worried of the Bangladesh as a whole is having trouble on that. Yeah, he... Okay. Okay, he's back. He's oh, back. I'm back now. Oh, uh, good. You should be reminded that even though we have got 100% power connection and the uh, energy state minister says that we have got 50% reserve capacity, uh, power cut, maje maje hoye jai. I understand. Uh, so be prepared for some of that occasionally. Okay, all right. Thank you. All right, thank you. Well, good. I'm um, glad that uh, uh, to be with all of you today. Uh, I don't know why I cannot. Uh, 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 you, mean, you can't know because I was trying to give you a video connection. That, that is not. Now no, yeah. we have it. Ah, okay. Yes. Again. Oh. Yeah. Well, it's. Uh, external dependence and to uh, refer it back to our experiences in the post liberation period. Uh, and I think he. Took, uh, some, uh, took some reflections from my book, which I wrote, The Crisis of External Dependence, uh, which came out in about 1981. Uh, in fact, uh, through the 1980s and part of the 90s, I was writing about external dependence. I think both uh, Nazrul Islam and uh, Akash uh, and Mustafiz, I think also, worked with me in uh, from aid dependence to self-reliance. The study we brought out as a successor study to my crisis of external dependence. Now, the world has changed considerably since the time of liberation. So essentially what I will try to do over here is to look at the sequencing in the dynamics of uh, Bangladesh's external dependence uh, going back to the pre-liberation and immediate aftermath of liberation, to then uh, trace the changing approach to external dependence in the post Bangabandhu era, in the period of the 80s and the 90s, uh, when there was an ascendancy of external dependence in that period. And uh, we moved into a much more hegemonic regime uh, in relation to the donors. And then to move to the third phase of my presentation, which is the 21st century uh, period in which there was a progressive decline in external dependence and the consequential implications of this for Bangladesh's uh, external relations in its political economy. And I will conclude this, because this will be the relevant point of concluding the discussion, by actually situating the Bangladesh situation in the wider framework of the changing global order. Because what has been happening to us is uh, closely related to what has been happening in the global system and the changing balance of economic power within the global system, which is really impacted on the nature of external dependence. 
we should all keep in mind that there are many sorts of external dependence and that uh, the advanced capitalist countries were them have themselves historically always been externally dependent. The imperialist countries were, of course, dependent on their quest for global markets, on their quest for uh, resources captured by their colonizing of territories and for the export of capital in the tradition that was developed in the literature by Lenin, Hilford Ring, and Hobson, uh, Hobson about the compulsions of capitalist countries to export capital uh, in order to maintain the rate of profit and to then sort of sustain the growth of their economies. But th those are issues which I do not intend to go into. I'm talking essentially about the developing country experience and Bangladesh's experience within that context. Now, we inherited our external dependence. Uh, those of you who have any recollection of the order under the Pakistan regime in the period of the 50s and 60s, will be aware of the growing dependence, particularly during the 1960s, when uh, Pakistan was a heavily aid dependent economy. And in those days, of course, the principal dependence was on the United States, who was far and away the principal aid donor, the World Bank, which played a very important part in uh, determining Pakistan's development strategy at that time. And essentially, that was a period in which uh, external dependence came with its own political price, where donors played a prominent role in influencing policy. In the 50s, the aid was largely used for uh, drawing us into military pacts, into the Baghdad Pact and into Seattle. Uh, and uh, dependence on aid was instrumental in uh, defining our political alliances. In the uh, 60s, in the Kennedy regime, in the Johnson regime, these were eight years of democratic rule. The whilst uh, military aid was an important factor, uh, they were much more focused on economic aid and used the dependence on it to then uh, exercise an influential role. The uh, World Bank was a major player throughout the 1960s in determining the direction of the Pakistan economy. The Harvard Advisory Group, again, played a very critical role in that period. Uh, they were located in, within the planning commission of Pakistan and played a very important role. The uh, Bangladeshi economists of that time, uh, I played a fairly active role in that along with, I suppose, I, 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 I think Anisul Rahman and uh, Abu Mahmood and others, were naturally very critical uh, of the policies which made us donor dependent. And we were correspondingly also very critical of donors at that time because we believed that it was donor resources which were playing an instrumental role in propping up the Ayub regime. Again, I'm not sure how many of you may have ever seen my first book, which I wrote on um, basic democracies and works program, uh, in which say, I used uh, the USPL for it aid program, which channeled uh, surplus US food aid uh, into, into Pakistan, but more specifically into East Pakistan to underwrite a major works program. Uh, and this played a very critical role in sustaining a huge system of basic democracies because the uh, basic democracies and the social formation that they represented in the rural areas played an instrumental role in building constituencies for the uh, uh, for Ayub's regime and his particular electoral system, which was predicated on uh, voting by the basic Democrats. Uh, so in that work, I was very critical of uh, US policy in uh, underwriting this because the uh, PL480 program and the works program in East Pakistan at that time was reportedly meant to be the biggest such aid program 
uh, focused on public works in the world at that time. So it played a very important role. Uh, in fact, I got into a famous debate as a consequence of my book with uh, Harvard uh, e economist uh, John Thomas, who wrote his PhD thesis in Harvard on the issue of the success of the world. I mean, we had quite a number of academic exchanges in various journals at that time. Anyway, the uh, main point I wish to make is that when uh, the main issue which was emerging towards the end of the Pakistan uh, regime phase when the emergence of Bangladesh centered around the monopolization of aid use by West Pakistan because the transfer of resources which had historically taken place from East to West Pakistan was largely done through the appropriation of our surplus foreign exchange. But by the second half of the 60s, uh, the Bangladesh, East Pakistan economy had reached a point where we had now gone into deficit on our external account. And so West Pakistan had historically been on deficit. We went into deficit more recently, whereas our own development uh, was picked up. As a consequence, the deficits on both sides, with the much larger deficit of West Pakistan, was largely being financed by foreign aid. So one of our big quarrels, and this was addressed in the report of the panel of economists of the fourth five-year plan, was on the appropriation by the Pakistanis of the largest share of foreign aid. And so one of the central elements of the uh, Bongabandhu six-point program was naturally to uh, establish control, not just over our foreign exchange resources, but more important, over our aid resources and to invest us with the right to negotiate our own aid and to then uh, 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 oversee its utilization. Anyway, when Bangladesh was, of course, created and emerged as an independent country, we had moved into a very different situation because at the time of the uh, liberation of Bangladesh, uh, we did not inherit what was a growing economy uh, on the eve of the liberation war, where in fact uh, there was some improvement in levels of development. We inherited a completely war devastated economy with the entire infrastructure destroyed with our agriculture in a state of dislocation with pending famine. And uh, more important, we uh, had a complete uh, institutional vacuum created through the uh, uh, through the uh, um, fleeing away of the uh, Pakistani capitalist classes. Because you must remember yeah. that up to the liberation of Bangladesh, yeah. the entire oh, economy, yeah. Bangladesh and the private sector had been completely dominated by Pakistanis in the area of industries, uh, uh, banking, uh, insurance, uh, uh, foreign trade, domestic uh, wholesale trade, uh, interwing trade, all were completely dominated by Pakistanis. And everything in that everyone fled away. And there was a complete vacuum which had to be filled by the rapid intervention of the state through the nationalization processes. However, having fill the vacuum, we could not fill the resource vacuum because if you had a completely non-functional economy where the industrial sector had gone through a process of temporary breakdown, you had no foreign exchange resources at all. You had an agricultural sector which was on the verge of uh, famine because successive harvests had not been sort of properly planted and harvested. So aid dependence was a very essential feature and most important was the need to rehabilitate the infrastructure. So uh, initial program of aid came in largely led by India. Uh, people have forgotten that in the first uh, part of it, during 1992, India was the primary aid giver of Pakistan in Bangladesh. And they gave most of their aid in the form of grants and very little, of course, in the way of soft loans. 
In fact, during that period, uh, India uh, moved something like 800,000 tons of food grains into Bangladesh. They were wow. the principal source of supply at that time because uh, the uh, Chittagong port was this, uh, the, at that time uh, unusable because of the mining of the harbor. And uh, the main uh, access to the Bangladesh economy was overland to India. The UN system then came in, it provided a lot of logistical support. But the Bangladesh government, the food distribution system, the political mobilization which took place were instrumental in averting famine at that, uh, during the first part in the early 1972 and in the period after that. And had, had we not had uh, access to rapidly di dispersed India uh, aid at that time, both in terms of food and commodities and in equipment for the repairing of our bridges and the roles of the engineers in repairing the uh, uh, Harding Bridge and the uh, Prince of Wales Bridge, now what we call the Meghna Bridge at that time. So this was our situation. Now, when we came in to the Planning Commission at that time, uh, aid negotiations and the supervision of aid and its allocation and disbursement was all within the domain of the Planning Commission and it was controlled by the External Resources Division. Uh, this was an area which, in fact, uh, Nurul Islam played a very critical role in that as the deputy chairman and the person who was the principal person in charge of uh, aid negotiations. But then when Saidu Zaman managed to escape from Pakistan and join us in the beginning of 73, and he took over as secretary of the planning commission and uh, chief of the external resources division, then he was uh, the principal uh, partner with Nurul Islam in handling our aid relations. And of course, he again knows much more about this subject along with Nubal Islam than I do. However, the critical issue was that if you were going into a phase where the compulsions of the economy as it existed at that time, where you needed to actually reactivate an economy which was flat on its back, you were going to create space for donors to come in and you were going to build up a state of external dependence. So the critical issue was how to actually deal with such a situation. Uh, the people who came into the Planning Commission, I think Nurul Islam was always a much more pragmatic person about these, but certainly people like Panish <coughs> and myself and up to Oit Musharraf had very strong views on getting back into a system which we had strongly criticized in the Pakistan period about the whole problems associated with external dependence. And here, Mr. Tajuddin, as the finance minister, was felt even more strongly on this subject. Though I think his main objection to aid dependence at that time was that he didn't want us to become dependent either on the World Bank or the uh, United States. So I think particularly because of the US role in 1971, he had very strongly antagonistic feelings towards the United States. Uh, so in fact, uh, when uh, uh, the World Bank, early in 1972, uh, sent us a message, and here I wish to make a brief diversion. Whilst we saw the World Bank in the 1960s as essentially much more friendly to West Pakistan, they had, towards the later part of the 60s, become, tried to become much more actively engaged in uh, then East Pakistan. And they had come up with this nine volume study on uh, the management of Bangladesh, or East Pakistan's water resources. Um, during 1971, actually, uh, contrary to our expectations, the World Bank played a much more positive role uh, in relation to aid. Uh, you may remember if any of you have read my first memoir, that I was entrusted by Mr. Tajuddin uh, at the beginning of April 1971 uh, with uh, initiating a global campaign 
post stoppage of aid to Pakistan because we deduced that Pakistan, being a heavily aid dependent country, needed to get regular inflows of aid in order to sustain their military campaign and genocide in Bangladesh. And so a principal external mission of, of, the Bangladesh, of the Bangladesh movement was to have aid stopped. And so when I came into Washington um, in early May, uh, at that time, uh, this was before the Bangladeshis in the embassy had defected and set up an independent mission. Uh, my main task was to go to the World Bank, to go to the aid agencies, and more important, to go to Congress and the media to persuade them to stop aid to Pakistan as long as they continued the genocide and went on suppressing the democratic process. Mohsen Siddiqui, at that time, along with Inayat Rahim, uh, were very helpful in taking me around to a number of these places where I was, in fact, uh, when I was uh, either going to the Congress or going to the media. So this was my first exposure to dealing with donors to stop aid rather than to receive aid. I know, um, the World Bank was responsive. They, uh, we, I was sent to the consortium meetings in Paris in July and then in November. And in both the crucial meetings, decisions were taken that as long as the uh, situation in East Pakistan was destabilized and killing was going on and the economy was not functioning, no new aid should be pledged to Pakistan. So the aid program, as far as the World Bank and its consortium were concerned, was tremendously, uh, aid campaign was tremendously successful and in fact, 1971, a major campaign within the US to get the Nixon administration to stop aid to Pakistan was also partially successful. Uh, and the US also pledged uh, very little aid, even though they were strongly supporting the Yahya regime. We mobilized the US Congress against Pakistan regime and uh, the Saxby Church Amendment to the aid bill was in fact on the verge of being passed when the entire aid bill itself was voted down in the Congress. So very little of new aid went into Pakistan and they were dependent entirely on the aid pipeline which was supplying what little aid was coming in. Now, because of this role which they thought is a positive role, they felt that Bangladesh would be very receptive uh, to looking to uh, uh, getting back into business with the World Bank and they hope to revive relations which existed as in Pakistan. And so when uh, Macna we got a message that McNamara was coming to Bangladesh in the beginning of, uh, I think it was uh, February of 1972, uh, he was going to fly in by helicopter on a, from a visit to India. Uh, he would be royally received and much would be made of his presence, but the mood was very different, and he was given a very casual reception. And uh, on his arrival, uh, no great demands were made for aid on him. He wasn't received in the way that he had been accustomed to receive whenever he visited any state. Uh, this reflected the mood of Bangladesh at that time, though I'm not sure that it was diplomatically the wisest thing to do. But actually, it did not have that much of an impact because the World Bank rapidly recognized us. It had not given us sovereign recognition. And it then uh, agreed to uh, set up its mission over here. And quite remarkably, uh, Bangladesh was given the right, uh, was requested to identify who they would like to have as their resident representative in uh, to represent the bank and to open their office. I, if, I, I, I'm, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this was the first time in the history of the World Bank that they had ever given a host country the chance to name their own uh, resident representative. And Nurul Islam, I think, identified Just Fallon, the Norwegian, who we felt would be much more friendly to us because he came from a country which had no political interest in Bangladesh and would play 
a much more neutral role. In fact, he didn't play a neutral role. He became very pro-Bangladeshi as the time went on. And eventually, uh, his services were discontinued. And I suspect that the bank never again in its history ever gave another recipient country the right to nominate its own uh, resident representative on the basis of that experience. Anyway, uh, in this situation that we had of aid dependence, our role was to try to navigate this relationship where we needed the aid, we tried to negotiate it, but we tried to ensure that we did so with no strings attached so that no uh, political and policy conditionality should be associated with the incoming aid for Bangladesh. Now, this was a very tricky role to play because here we were war devastated, bankrupt country attempting to stand up to the most powerful donors in the world. And we also had a big, a massive need for foreign aid at that time. But uh, as far as I can say, during the initial period when we could sustain this position, uh, we negotiated a great deal of aid, but I cannot recollect any significant conditionalities being imposed on us, which was not uh, spontaneously acceptable to us. Uh, I had to deal with a number of major aid projects because I was dealing with the infrastructure sectors of the economy and the industrial sector where they were most prone to give policy advice. And I was very strongly resistant to it. In fact, over and above what you may say would be sort of sensible economic diplomacy. But I mean, that was the situation. The second way in which we thought we would deal with this was to try to diversify our aid dependence and to move away from the massive dependence on the World Bank of the US. So at that time, we believed that the uh, socialist bloc would be a good source for diversifying our aid relations. In the second volume of my uh, memoirs, which has just been released, in fact, the global edition is already out, the Bangladesh edition will appear in another few days. I point out my experiences about traveling to Eastern Europe with our foreign minister, Abdus Samad Azad. Aid relations with the, uh, uh, reaching out to the socialist bloc. Entertain this rather romantic illusion about the socialist world being the friend will to then come in and uh, fill the gap. We thought of Cuba uh, and we thought of Allende's Chile as examples in which the Soviet Union had stepped in and played a big supporting role in the economy. But in our case, even though Bongo Bondu went to Moscow and as his first international visit uh, and built up very good relations, one of which was the commitment by Brezhnev to send uh, the Soviet fleet uh, from Vladivostok to clear Chittagong and demine the ports over there, which they did very effectively. And they also gave us a certain amount of aid. No big aid options emerged from there. And my experience in Eastern Europe, where I traveled to six countries, was even less satisfactory. Because I found that there was very little socialism when you were dealing with the uh, uh, aid giving institutions of the Eastern European countries. Uh, whilst at the opening meetings with their foreign and finance ministers, uh, and even we met their presidents. Uh, everyone was very uh, talking about the rhetoric of third world and socialist solidarity. The objective reality was that when you negotiated, you were negotiating with hard-nosed businessmen who were offering you not soft loans, but fairly hard loans on tough terms, and I had to go and negotiate with them to bring their terms down. In fact, in Romania, I remember, we, I even had the occasion of having to go up to the president at that time, the late lamented Mr. Ceausescu, to in fact get aid, uh, interest rates reduced on the loans that Romania was actually giving us. Anyway, what we discovered 
is that whilst you may get a certain amount made from the socialist world, they were not in any way to, uh, position to uh, emerge as alternative sources of aid. Uh, we again uh, look to India, but what India did for us in the early days, they were not in a position to do on a sustained basis because after all, India at that time was the largest recipient of foreign aid in the world and was dealing with their own aid consortium led by the World Bank. So that what they did uh, as a, on an emergency basis in the early years was simply not sustainable. Nor could India in fact come in and fill the vacuum with the withdrawal of the Pakistanis uh, had led to. There was a great apprehension at the time of liberation that the Indians would come in as carpet baggers and they would then take over the industries abandoned by the Pakistanis and that Indian uh, hegemony would be established over Bangladesh because they would then come in with their main sources of capital. But actually, we had the good fortune of dealing with some very enlightened Indians at that time. The principal people we dealt with, Mr. P. N. Haksal and Mr. T. P. Thar, were actually themselves uh, ex-communists who retained much of the worldview which they had in the 1930s when they were really looking at the world. And uh, when we raised the issue with them, that you don't want a situation where the goodwill you've accumulated will be dissipate, dissipated by Indian carpet, businessmen coming in and taking over our industries. They were very sympathetic to it. And an informal order was passed in the early days uh, of the post-liberation period, where the Indian government set out to restrain any of the big business houses from actually traveling to Bangladesh. I mean, people could argue that was not a very smart move, and that if you could get the Tatas and the Birlas and other people to come in, it would be to our advantage. But we did not want Adamjis and Bhavanis to be replaced by Tatas and Birlas, and the Indian government supported us in this. However, all this became academic because what really frustrated the inflow of Indian capital was the nationalization program that all the major key sectors of the economy were actually taken over by the state. So there was no vacuum uh, at that point for Indian capital to actually come in. So amazingly in the early, in the Bangabandhu period, you had a situation in which uh, once normal relations returned, India's participation in Bangladesh's foreign trade was below 5%. And there was negligible foreign investment coming in. I remember one or two projects for joint ventures were being negotiated. And then until, I, until the Planning Commission opened up its negotiations for building interstate relations, we could set the agenda. And when I went to uh, India with Nubal Islam and Mustajuddin in May of 1972, uh, I took with me a full policy paper saying that we have to redesign Indo-Bangladesh relations on the basis of sovereign equality. And the way to do it is by India helping us to build up Bangladesh's export capacity and to diversify our economy away from dependence on jute exports and to get into a situation where we would be setting up major industries like fertilizer and sponge iron and cement, and these would then be used for purposes of export to India. Uh, and we would uh, work on joint ventures where Bangladesh's natural gas could have value added to it and would be used as a major export opportunity. And India would create market space for us to do that. However, these projects which were negotiated and then were agreed upon uh, could not really be materialized. And so our objective of building up a more balanced pattern of economic relations with India, which was put on the table uh, as far back as 1974, really went on, was kept on ice for the next uh, virtually 45 years after the killing of Bangabandhu. And actually today we have got, we run a deficit of about, what is it, about seven to $8 billion with India. Uh, and uh, uh, relationships remain uh, imbalanced in favor of India because we could not make the necessary structural changes 
to uh, build up a much larger and more diversified export capacity to India. Anyway, the bottom line of this is that when you try to build up an autonomous uh, relationship with donors, but you remain a heavily aid-dependent country, uh, this creates certain objective problems, and we paid the price for it. Countries which want to become self-reliant need to discipline themselves. They need to raise their rates of savings. They need to raise their rates of taxation. They need to enhance their capacity utilization within the domestic economy. And these were all problems which, even in that early period, I had faced great difficulty. In fact, in my second volume, a lot, I write several chapters on the whole problem I had for trying to get uh, enhanced capacity utilization and the strong resistance which came from all sectors of the government who would much prefer to get foreign aid to uh, import uh, hardware and to get, and to get uh, project resources in rather than uh, initially try to improve the capacity utilization and the efficiency with which existing resources were being managed. So I discussed the political economy of this process, and this was one of the problems. Nor could we uh, successfully enhance our tax capacity, nor could we raise our rates of domestic savings. And this precondition actually persisted post-75, all the way up to the uh, end of the century, where successive regimes with low rates of savings with uh, low taxation capacity, where Bangladesh's tax GDP ratio remained one of the lowest independence, which were close to 13 to 14% of the GDP. And you went through a long phase where 100% of the annual development plan was aid financed, and anything from 40 to 50% of our total budget was, in fact, actually being underwritten by aid. So this was the era of aid dependence. And one of the consequences which became fairly rampant after uh, 1975 was the gradual ascent of the donors over setting policy agendas for Bangladesh. Uh, we went through the decade of structural adjustment lending, attachment of aid conditionalities to all aid which was coming in. I remember when I briefly went into the caretaker government of Shah, President, the late President Shahbuddin, uh, I was in charge of uh, aid relations, external aid relations. And I was also then chairing all the ethnic meetings at that time. And all these aid projects would come before us. And I don't suppose the finance minister or the uh, uh, person in charge of this was expected to look at all these projects. But I, uh, being who I was, actually read them. And I would see an uh, aid agreement being signed with 20 pages of conditionalities attached to it. And I would look at it and I would laugh and say that in 100 years, Bangladesh is incapable of fulfilling three-fourths of the conditionalities which are attached to it. I remember Inam Ahmed was my secretary and secretary ERD. And so I said, why, how do you agree to all this? So they said, that's how we get the aid. We know that we'll sign it. We agree to fulfill the conditions and then we will actually not fulfill the conditions. And that is the objective reality of the way in which our relations with the donors are worked out. But at that time, when I came in, the level of uh, donor ascendancy over setting policy agendas was quite mind-boggling. Now, what has happened, and I'm moving the discussion on, is that this situation more or less persisted, I would say, up to about the uh, mid-90s. In a way, actually, there is a coincidence in the move into the democratic era. Because the democratic era uh, coincided with an acceleration in growth. The growth generated uh, higher levels of revenue. And of course, we were then 
gradually moving into our phase of uh, ready-made garment exports. I mean, this process began in the beginning of the 80s. And then then enabled us to part the scope for labor intensive exports, industrialization and exports was then sort of really reaching its ascendance. And here I think uh, we prospered. Uh, whilst we went through many problems in the early phase, uh, by the 90s, we were really now moving into high tide and we were beginning to go through a process of building up backward linkages in the economy at that time. Uh, and uh, the value addition coming from our exports was correspondingly also increasing. So that by the time we came to the turn of the century, Bangladesh had got a very significant source of export earnings. Our uh, migrants had become a major source of foreign exchange remittance into the country. And Bangladesh had accumulated alternative resources, both for domestic financing of the budget and also for uh, capital imports and in intermediate imports uh, coming from our enhanced export earnings at that time. So these were all very important features which have taken place in the economy. And this process has accelerated, certainly under the uh, period with uh, Sheikh Hasina in power in the post from 2009, this process has accelerated even further. But, uh, where you had a situation in the 80s where age GDP ratio was in the range of about 12 to 13%, uh, gradually, this has now come down, and the age GDP ratio will be in a range of about uh, two to three percent today. Uh, at the same time, you have a situation in which uh, our uh, our need for uh, budgetary resources for financing big projects is also available. I mean, when we went into a state of confrontation with the World Bank over the financing of the Fodda Bridge, at the end, uh, the Prime Minister could say that we will finance the bridge from our own resources. And she certainly had the resources, not only of financing the Fodda Bridge, but financing several Fodda Bridges if she needed to do that. And a whole range of uh, develop, uh, a whole range of uh, uh, other projects uh, which could be underwritten from the budget resources available to them. Now, what has actually changed in terms of our relations with the donors? Obviously, you went through, as I said, this phase of uh, donor hegemony over our policy discourse. And again, uh, just as we were having <clears throat> this conflictual relations with donors during the Pakistan times, Sitting in BIDS, I was having major debates uh, both with the government and with the donors about the whole merits of structural adjustment loans and the Washington consensus based policy regime. And uh, we were challenged in this on the research at BIDS and also in terms of the policy advocacy we were doing, what we were writing in the newspapers. So this process went on for the 80s and the 90s. And actually, what is interesting is that uh, by the 90s, the World Bank's approach to uh, policy imposition and also went through a change. The, a new phrase entered about policy ownership, where it was argued that unless the uh, aid recipient country themselves wanted the policies and were ready to implement them unless they were willing to practice good governance, uh, there was no point in imposing policy conditionalities. All the issues we had been actually raising, that uh, unless you address governance issues, unless the government took responsibility over its own policy reforms, no reforms could work, which of course was validated then when the bank began changing its own position. So these changes were already taking place in the global system.
But at the end, I would say that when you move into the is that we are actually no longer an independent country in any objective sense of the term. Uh, the two to three percent of aid we get is itself not being very efficiently used. And there is a huge accumulated aid pipeline which has been built up because of our inability to rapidly disperse and utilize this aid. So with whatever aid we have, we seem to be managing to sustain our increasing levels of development. And this has established essentially that donors have now become a principal part of our external economic relations. The donors cannot now come and impose policies on government. Of course, they don't need to do that because much of the policy regime, which has been internalized into the policy uh, consciousness of successive governments, including the present government, is uh, very concurrent with the donors' worldview of what policies should take place. In fact, donors are now telling us that we should be playing, uh, paying much more attention to uh, poverty elimination. And also, they are now giving us uh, lectures and policy advice on reducing inequalities, which they say is Bangladesh is facing even though with rapid growth and some po the poverty reduction uh, inequalities are widening and Bangladesh should be doing something about this. So we are now getting lectures from the donors where we used to be charging the donors that their policy agendas are contributing to the widening of inequality and uh, the perpetuation of poverty. So these are all interesting developments. Now, essentially what has happened to Bangladesh today is that we moved from being an aid-dependent country to being a trade-dependent country. This is a very important and critical period. Today, if you want to know who exercises the greatest uh, political influence over Bangladesh, if they were wanting to exercise it, I would say it would be Saudi Arabia because of the very large number of migrants who actually go there. So we will do very little in Bangladesh to get on the wrong side of Saudi Arabia. I don't know that we will go out of our way to go and join them in fighting the Yemenis or anything like that. But as far as we are concerned, uh, we would certainly not get into any confrontation with them. On the second issue of uh, uh, relationships with uh, the with the uh, trade, uh, our main export sources for ready-made garments. The EU is now the most powerful factor. The US was our largest single market. And for a long period, we were attempting to have good relations with the US in the hope that they would give us duty-free access uh, to their markets. We pay 15% duty to get into that market. But rather than actually get duty-free access uh, at the time of the Rana Plaza uh, event and its aftermath, they actually withdrew GSP privileges to Bangladesh, which gave uh, duty-free access to a whole range of other products, uh, which were available to us and to a lot of other developing countries. And they even excluded us from financing under what came to be known as the Millennium Challenge Account where a special uh, chunk of aid was put aside by the US to give to selected developing countries, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, uh, <clears throat> but not Bangladesh, on account of their approving the way in which we were sort of handling our political system and human rights and so on and so forth. So in a whole range of areas where US wanted to uh, use its trade relations with us and also give us aid. Uh, we have really not advanced very much. And so today we have very little of foreign aid coming from the US. They give about three or four hundred million dollars, which is actually less than the four seven hundred and fifty billion dollars, which are generated by uh, uh, by tariff protection on Bangladesh's 
uh, garment exports to the U.S. So you may say that we are net givers of external resources to the United States rather than the heavy recipients of U.S. Uh, largesse. <clears throat> now, in this aid dependent, in this trade dependent regime, we are now having to face some very critical situation. And as more of trade relations are now becoming increasingly politicized, uh, whether it is from sanctions, whether it is from preferential tariff and market access, uh, everyone is now looking at your, the nature of your politics, the nature of your democratic system, the human rights, the labor relation, the, the labor relations, all these have now become variables. And we have already been informed by the European Union that uh, as and when our duty-free privileges end from our, after our graduation, if we want to retain those privileges, we will then have to meet a whole range of political conditionalities, which they are really going to put on the table. So this is an issue which we have to think about. <clears throat> now, having said all this, we have to keep in mind that the world has also changed. In the world in which Bangladesh began its existence, the dominant economic power was the United States. They were at that time the principal source of capital inflows. They were the largest market. They were the largest sources of supply into the international system, whether of food aid or whether of capital exports. Now, this has been gradually changing over the years. You first had the rise of the oil exporting countries in the 70s and 80s, where they built up large capital surpluses, which sustained the growth of their economy and sustained our migrant labor coming in and benefiting from that. <clears throat> and uh, they then started accumulating large reserves uh, which were then being banked in the United States. Now, as the Asian economies grew and became more export-oriented and dynamic, they now emerged as a much more competitive source of capital accumulation and export growth. And of course, this process was led by China. Now, today, China is the world's largest exporter of goods in the world. It is now also emerging as the largest source of capital in the world. In fact, China's uh, foreign exchange reserves of something like about $3 trillion makes them the largest reserve holders in the world. Uh, they also hold the largest sovereign wealth funds in the world, extending into a billion and a half dollars. They also are very critical elements in financing US deficits. So that uh, China and Japan both hold the largest amount of US treasury bills, which finance US budget deficits. I mean, they both hold uh, treasury bills in the range of about 1.2 to 1.3 billion dollars each. <clears throat> now, as China has expanded, unlike the accumulation of surpluses of capital with the uh, the oil exporting countries. China's surpluses have come from their export competitiveness, their diversification of the economy, and their becoming the factory of the world, where uh, production <laughs> increasingly located in China, have been located in China, and have been done so because they are the most competitive sources of supply. <clears throat> and this has essentially meant that unlike uh, commodity-based uh, surplus capital surpluses, surpluses built up through export competitiveness are going to be going on forever and ever because there's no reason why they will become less competitive as the years go by. <clears throat> In this situation, what you are now witnessing is the rebalancing of the global economic order. The United States, uh, you will notice, uh, has now become a major deficit country in the world. 
It runs large budget deficits. It runs large trade deficits. Much of this originates with the fact that they have much lower rates of savings than are warranted by an economy which is still the largest economy in the world. The capacity of the American citizen to, uh, to spend rather than to save is now a well-known structural feature of the US economy. Secondly, the US economy is now in a whole range of areas where it had got export competitive, has now gradually been uh, overtaken and a whole range of areas of the US economy have now progressively gone into decline. The whole Trump phenomenon has been built around the fact that whole segments of the US have now really become industrially derelict. And the people, white collar workers, mostly sort of uh, sub college educated white people, have really now become from being a major supporter of the Democratic Party, have now become a major sort of dissenting element, which have now uh, given their loyalty to Trump, his version of republicanism. So essentially, the US is now progressively retreating into the status of a second, second grade economic power and has been overtaken by China. It is the US now which has become the main source of uh, challenging the smooth progression towards a globalized economic order. It is becoming more protectionist, more inward looking, more willing to then try to change the rules of the game to suit its own convenience in order to then uh, uh, withstand the growing competitiveness of China. But at the end, uh, the objective reality of the world are that it is China which is making inroads into all areas of the world which were hitherto dominated by the US. Today, in fact, China is emerging as the major trading partner, not just within Asia itself, and I say I don't just say Southeast Asia and East Asia, where it has overtaken the US as the largest trading partner, but in South Asia, where it has overtaken both the US and also India as the largest trading partner. In fact, China is India's second largest trading partner. At the same time, it is now emerging as the largest trading partner and source of capital flows to sub-Saharan Africa. It is emerging as the largest trading partner to various parts of Latin America. In fact, countries such as uh, some of the big commodity exporting countries like uh, Brazil and Chile and others have all now found that their major trading relationships are no longer with the United States, but with China. So that in these circumstances, now, China has moved into a whole range of areas which were hitherto within the uh, domain of the United States. So the nature of external dependence has now changed very radically for a country such as Bangladesh. We are now no longer dependent on our traditional sources of dependence. Up to a point, we have got trade dependence, and that can be used as a leverage against us by some countries. But this is not being exercised or mostly over your economic policies. There is some political leverage to be exercised, but not on your economic policies. <clears throat> Secondly, we now find that our dependence, if anything, is progressively growing in the Asian region. In fact, China is now emerging as the principal source of capital imports into Bangladesh. Now, Japan is a very big aid donor in Bangladesh. In fact, in terms of traditional aid, Japan is far and away the biggest donor. But I did a bit of research recently, and I was amazed to find that I came across 67 infrastructure projects in Bangladesh, which are being implemented in partnership with the Chinese, with a whole range of Chinese firms. And the uh, investments associated with these projects add up to $29 billion. 
Now, that is not a small amount of money. We have never seen money like that in Bangladesh. And this is happening increasingly in the areas of our infrastructure development. Uh, the BRI or the Belt and Road Initiative actually uh, pledged, uh, I don't know, it is, what did he pledge? About $20 billion, Musafis? What was the BRI pledge, roughly? Huh. Oh, you are muted. Anyway. 20, $25 billion, sir. $25 billion. So yes. essentially, of the future of Bangladesh in a whole range, certainly, of Asian countries, including much of the Arab world itself, because the, for the oil exporting countries now, uh, it is no longer uh, the US and Europe, which is the principal market for their oil exports. It is really Asia, and particularly mainly China, followed by India. So both their import dependence on, on China has grown, the export dependence on China has grown, and because China has got this huge volume of capital surpluses at its disposal, and <laughs> rates of domestic savings today of close to 40%, its capacity to generate capital and to then export it and use it as an instrument for uh, finding, uh, 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 creating economic opportunities for themselves and their businesses remains now the most uh, critical element of the dynamic of the global economy. So I'll start, I'll bring my, uh, bring my uh, discussion to a close here. And you can ask questions. That the world which we entered in 1972 is now a very different world from today. And the 21st century is essentially going to be the Asian century. Uh, whilst we have already established that it is emerging as the principal source of capital, it's also uh, China is now our principal source of imports. It has far exceeded India. It's, and for most South Asian countries now, China has become the main source of imports. Now, the crucial breakthrough will come when China can integrate us into the supply chains, which they have built up with Southeast Asia and with uh, East Asia, and South Asia can then also become part of the big Asian supply chain, where this then becomes our principal market rather than the Europe or North America. Once that process takes place, then you will certainly see that for Bangladesh, a completely new horizon has actually emerged for the remainder of this century. And that the sort of apprehensions that we had about uh, Western-dominated world, which existed uh, at the uh, eve of, of our liberation, is not the case today. But then we have to rethink the world in which China has now emerged as the dominant economic power. I mean, this is not the uh, time uh, uh, to discuss such an issue. It's a major issue itself. And what that sort of world would look like, what are the sort of problems which will emerge from that sort of world need to be considered. But if you would uh, want my parting observation, certainly as far as Bangladesh is concerned, it would make a good deal more sense for us to really step, I mean, I don't think we should uh, in any way uh, move away from the economic relations that we have with Europe and North America, those are important and there are big opportunities which still remain to be made. But the real future really lies within the Asian region. And it's a question of how the Asian region as a community resolves, whether the contradictions between India and China can essentially be the address, whether harmony can really be maintained, whether China will remain as a major economic partner without seeking political hegemony. These are the issues which we need to address. Thank you very much. Thank you.
আমরা আপনাদেরকে অনুরোধ করেছিলাম যারা কোয়েশ্চেন করতে চান তারা আমাদের চ্যাট বক্সে কোয়েশ্চেন দেওয়ার জন্য কিন্তু আমি দেখছি এখানে খুব বেশি কোয়েশ্চেনে একটা কোয়েশ্চেন সম্ভবত আমি পেয়েছি চ্যাট বক্সে তো হাওয়ার যারা দেখছেন আমাদের এই অনুষ্ঠানটি ফেসবুকে তাদেরকে আমি আবারও শুভেচ্ছা জানাচ্ছি এই অনুষ্ঠানটি যারা দেখতে পারছেন না তাদের জন্য এটুকুই বলে রাখছে প্রগতির যাত্রীর ইউটিউব চ্যানেলেও গিয়েও আপনারা এই অনুষ্ঠানটি পরবর্তীতে দেখতে পারবেন আমি আশা করছি আপনারা পরবর্তীতে দেখবেন এই অনুষ্ঠানটি আহ আমার মনে হয় আমরা এই কোয়েশ্চেন আনসার পর্ব এই পর্বে আমি আর চ্যাট বক্স থেকে কোয়েশ্চেন আহ না যারা আলো করতে চান তারা হ্যান্ড রেস করে কোয়েশ্চেন করতে চান প্রফেসর রফিকুল ইসলাম বোধ একটা কোয়েশ্চেন করেছেন উনি আমার মনে হয় সেই কোয়েশ্চেনটা আপনি নিজেই করুন আপনি রফিকুল ইসলাম আপনি কি আছেন আমাদের সাথে নর্থ আমেরিকা থেকে করেছেন আপনি আনমিউট করে কথা বলেন ডাক্তার রফিকুল ইসলাম হ্যাঁ না শুনতে পাচ্ছেন আপনাকে ধন্যবাদ প্রগতি যাত্রীকে এবং আজকে আলোচক সম্মানিত সুবানকে শুনছিলাম খুব ভালো লাগছিল আমার প্রশ্ন ছিল যে আজকের যে আমরা যে জায়গায় এসেছি সেই বাহাত্তর থেকে আজকে পর্যন্ত পঞ্চাশ বছর পথ পরিক্রমা তো আগামী পঞ্চাশ বছর না ধরি অন্তত আগামী বিশ বছরের জন্য সবচেয়ে এই জায়গায় দাঁড়িয়ে থাকা বা আরো সামনে দিয়ে আগানোর জন্য সবচেয়ে বড় চ্যালেঞ্জ কি কি আমাদের এটাই আমার প্রশ্ন থ্যাংক ইউ রবিন এটা তো প্রশ্ন তো আমার জন্য বড় চ্যালেঞ্জ হয়ে গেছে বিগত এইটা ধরে একটা বিরাট উত্তর লাগে বঙ্গবন্ধু <laughs> এইটা আমার সবচেয়ে বড় চ্যালেঞ্জ ভালো উন্নতি হচ্ছে গ্রোথ হচ্ছে সবকিছু হচ্ছে বাট উই হ্যাভ বিকাম মাচ মো আনইকুয়াল অ্যান্ড নট নেসেসারিলি জাস্ট সোসাইটি অ্যাজ ওয়াজ অ্যান্টিসিপেট অ্যাজ ওয়াজ ড্রেমড অফ বাই বঙ্গবন্ধু থ্যাংক ইউ স্যার হ্যালো আলোচনার জন্য আপনার সেকেন্ড ভলিউম মেমোয়ার্স আমি পড়ছিলাম এবং তাতে আপনি এখন আজকে যে সমস্ত কথা বললেন ওগুলো আরো বিস্তারিত সেখানে আছে কাজে আমি সবাইকে এনকারেজ করবো ওটা পড়তে তো আমি আমি জাস্ট দুটো অবজারভেশন টু কমপ্লিমেন্ট হোয়াট হি হ্যাভ জাস্ট সেড এবং একটা প্রশ্ন যেটা কিছুটা আপনি ইতিমধ্যে উত্তর দিয়েছেন সেটা হচ্ছে যে আই ফুললি এগ্রি যে এখন ওয়ার্ল্ড সিচুয়েশন হ্যাজ ডোমেটিক্যালি চেঞ্জ এবং গোয়িং ফরওয়ার্ড আমাদের ইস্ট এশিয়া ইন পার্টিকুলার চায়নার সাথে আমাদের রিলেশনশিপটা সেটা ডিজাইন করা এবং সেটা কারেক্টলি ডিজাইন করা এবং ইমপ্লিমেন্ট করা সেটাই আমার মোস্ট ইম্পর্টেন্ট চ্যালেঞ্জিং টাস্ক এবং সেই ক্ষেত্রে আমাদের যেটা দাঁড়াচ্ছে সেটা হচ্ছে এটা বোধ অপরচুনিটিস এবং চ্যালেঞ্জিং অপরচুনিটিস আপনি যেটা বলেছেন এনরমাস ক্যাপিটাল রিসোর্সেস অ্যাকোম্পানিড বাই ইউনো এক্সেলেন্ট কাইন্ড অফ টেকনোলজিক্যাল ক্যাপাবিলিটি অফ ক্যারিং আউট লার্জ স্কেল ইনফ্রাস্ট্রাকচার প্রজেক্টস আনম্যাচড আই থিঙ্ক মানে এখন ইউএস এর অত ক্যাপাবিলিটি নাই বিভিন্ন ক্রিটিক্যাল ইনফ্রাস্ট্রাকচারাল টাস্ক ইমপ্লিমেন্ট করার জন্য যেটা চায়নার এখন আছে 
उटकम होते क्लोज एट होम श्रीलंकार एक्सपिरियंस देखते डिटार्मिनेशन फर्मुलेट कर डेभलपमेंट प्रसेस different contracting firms construction firms council era era mane it has become a kind of hunting ground bangladesh ne ki ki construction project er upor impulse kore dewa jay ebong bibhinno karone ei somosto project gulo oto ta mane scrutiny charai ebong overall ekta comprehensive ekta vision charai accepted hoye jacche billion and billion dollar budget er project er ebong seta मोस्ट constructed by chinese egulo onek bhalo poddeshe to hocche definitely bhalo kintu there are many such projects deshe ghurle dekha jay jeta etar merit ta not clear na to mane at least say to ei jinish ta ekta situation ta riyeche je a gap between the economic competence and the uh, competence to formulate independent policy strategies etc ei gap ta khub prokot hoye dariyeche ebong sei jagah ta jodi amra उटन any public kind of you know, debate even you know informing the public in a appropriate way ka je sei rokom situation e policy hole to sir mistakes hoar khub shombhabona theke jay khub to ei jinish ta short run kono kichu ane democratization at a general goal definitely we all support it we want it kintu in the in the short and medium run ar kichu concrete kichu kora jay ki na jate amra ei dhoron ekta risk ki jeta মানে অলরেডি সিমটমস আর এভরি আমি মানে একটা অ্যালার্ম ফিল করি যে অনেক যে দেখা যায় যে এখানে মনে হচ্ছে যে অনেক কিছু অনেক প্রজেক্টস অ্যাকসেপ্টেড হচ্ছে ওটার ইকোনমিক মেরিটটা খুব ভালোভাবে যাচাই করা হচ্ছে না ইজি যেহেতু এটা কন্ট্রাক্টর ড্রিভেন কন্ট্রাক্টররা এসে বিভিন্ন লাইন মিনিস্ট্রিতে যোগাযোগ করছে বিভিন্ন ইমপ্লিমেন্টিং এজেন্সিতে যাচ্ছে তাদের প্রজেক্ট পুশ করছে ব্যুরোক্রেটস টেকনোক্রেটস কনসালটেন্টস কন্ট্রাক্টরস অল আর জাস্ট ইন দা জাম্পিং অন দি मैंने 
One, of course, is that uh, policy dependence, say, on the Delta plan uh, and the related plans. The difference is that whilst we are contracting this out to experts outside or firms outside, uh, unlike the previous regimes, uh, it is not the, no one is putting political pressure on us to uh, implement these plans. Uh, we, are, we are providing the effective demand for this external dependence. It is an internal process. Similarly, this whole process of going out and indiscriminately then participating in uh, development projects it is our crony capitalists who are actually the instrumental force in bringing this into the country and going in and getting big projects uh, non transparently approved. It is a systemic shankot, uh, which is being faced in Bangladesh, which is associated with the weak status of the democratic process because an essential element of the democratic process is uh, maximum transparency where you are then in a position to uh, expose your major investment and policy decisions to public scrutiny and debate so taken in nahoy and erokom sanction and pressure is not available for in uh, domestically on uh, on the government then uh, people who have got political access who are part of the crony capitalist class will be reaching out to these big uh, project developers who are willing to provide uh, hard loans in order to underwrite the projects uh, to come and pick up these projects merely when the project is put into uh, initiation huge sums of money are to be made even at the outset for the initiation of the project. So you are not going to escape that. So you may make, a, you may make, you may identify the problem and the objective conditions, but the preconditions have to essentially be located within the domestic political economy and the way in which it is actually functioning. Thank you, sir. Act question, Dr. Rafiqul Islam, who from over the course, I mean, it a portion of the chair, only here to uh, Rafiqul Islam, our personal, how the creation of Bakshal, I should put about the update. Abdi Niji got the word in personal. Rafiqul, eh? After sound of Batsinamra, sound Batsina. Okay, I can read. Yes, sound Batsina. How the creation of Bakshal changed the international. Financial assistance providers' relationship to Bangladesh? Well, uh, I don't think it significantly did so. At least there was not enough time. I mean, if they saw, if the World Bank concluded and if Baksal had sustained and it was reflecting a much more radicalized <laughs> vision of Bangabandhu when he was talking of compulsory cooperative processes of that nature. And they would have thought that this represented a move away from the uh, policy agendas which were being advocated by the World Bank and was representing a much more uh, left-wing direction to policy, if that was the conclusion. Then uh, they would have been putting more pressure and using our external dependence because Oishamoito, the... Uh, we were no longer then in the planning commission. Bureaucrats were much more in control at that time. And bureaucrats have never had any problem in the history of Pakistan and Bangladesh with, uh, uh, with uh, external dependence. In fact, they kind of love it. Uh, and in fact, uh, participate in that process. So my expectation would have been that in those circumstances, uh, Bongo Bandhu would have faced a very serious <clears throat> if that is how they interpreted his policy move. But of course, uh, we don't know what might or might not have happened because uh, none of those processes uh, really move forward. 
থ্যাংক ইউ স্যার আমাদের সাথে ডক্টর এম এম আকাশ উপস্থিত আছেন আকাশ ভাই আপনি কি কিছু কমেন্ট কিংবা প্রশ্ন করতে চান আপনার আমি একটু একটু বলতে চাই স্যার স্যারের তো আলোচনা সব সময় এক্সেলেন্ট এবং একদম আপডেটেড থাকে স্ট্যাটিস্টিক্স পর্যন্ত থাকে সুতরাং ফার্স্ট অফ অল আই ওয়ান্ট টু থ্যাঙ্ক মাই বেলাভেড স্যার মাই মানে মাই মেন্টার মাই আমি তাকে খুবই শ্রদ্ধা করি কিন্তু আমি যেই পয়েন্টটা অ্যাড করতে চাই তার সঙ্গে স্যার যদি এগ্রি করেন বা স্যার হয়তো জানেনও সেটা সেটা হচ্ছে যে আমরা ছিলাম এইড ডিপেন্ডেন্ট হলাম ট্রেড ডিপেন্ডেন্ট তারপরে আমরা পলিসি ডিপেন্ডেন্সিটা থেকে কিন্তু বার হতে পারছি আমরা কিন্তু আমাদের নিজেদের ন্যাশনাল পলিসি নিজেদের ন্যাশনাল নলেজের বেসিসে তৈরি করে সেটাকে আমাদের স্টেটের মাঝে এস্টাবলিশ করতে পারছি না এখন এইটার এটাকে আমি যদি এই নাম দিই যে দের আর টু কাইন্ড অফ আদার ডিপেন্ডেন্সিস যেটা ইডিওলজিক্যাল ডিপেন্ডেন্সি একটা যে ফ্রি মার্কেট ইডিওলজি নিউ লিবারেল ইডিওলজি সেটা পৃথিবীতে আধিপত্য এখনো করছে চায়না যে রাইস করেছে চায়না কিন্তু মার্কেট ফ্রি একটা মিক্সড স্ট্র্যাটেজি নিয়ে রাইস করছে সুতরাং চায়নাকে দেখিয়েও কেউ নিউ লিবারেল স্ট্র্যাটেজিতে থাকতে পারে বলতে পারে চায়না ইজ ফলোইং বেইজিং কনসেনসাস which is almost similar to washington consensus so why not washington consensus erokom debate ache left er moddhe o ache right er moddhe o ache tar mane bangladesh er jonno je path towards democratic society path towards democratic economy that path cannot be constructed unless we become free from those ideological dependencies and also get free from internalizing those knowledge which are not uh, effective or not suitable for us so there is a uh, there has to be some some kind of uh, steps which will free us from those ideological dependencies and knowledge dependencies new knowledge new consciousness will have to be created even the bargaining power of our bureaucrats will have to be created to deal with china also so i think these issues are coming ahead well i again i agree with everything you say akash uh, but again the difference is that you see policy dependence implies that someone else is setting policies you are resistant to those policies but out of uh, economic necessity you are accepting it but actually what has happened in bangladesh today is that we have embraced those policies now and it has become internalized into the policy and class consciousness of the ruling elite so you are no longer having to impose policy on anybody they are themselves uh, the agents of those policies and they are seeking policy advice as far as possible which is consistent with their own policy preferences or it or not upre to in fact actually to the extent that uh, policy agendas about good better governance and better management of the uh, business practices and what they sort of call now uh, uh, good business practices is of so outside pressure is being ignored and you continue to take your position at the 150th position in terms of doing business in x and so on and so forth because that is the way in which the system actually works so your policy autonomy is in a way perversely already being demonstrated over here and uh, this is what you want now as far as the beijing consensus is concerned if such this the one big difference uh, which is setting beijing apart from previous hegemonic powers which went down the road of colonialism and imperialism is that they have no interest whatsoever 
in imposing their policy agendas on anybody. Their one supreme external policy agenda is, please do business with me. And I will come and put up your projects. I will even finance them. I hope you will be able to occasionally repay the loans. But if you are like Sri Lanka, we repay my loans. In fact, actually, uh, China has engaged in, I think, something like about uh, about 130 or 140 cases of debt forgiveness all over the developing world. And uh, where China or Pakistan are failing to manage the ports which the Chinese have set up, they have then swapped their loan into equity and have taken over the risk of managing the ports and making it productive. Jodi uni nao korte pare, to tar por to onar to khoti hobe. Sri Lanka er dukono khoti hobe na to. So the real issue therefore is that China is different and they are not projecting any ideology at all. This is the first time I imagine in contemporary in history, going back to the Roman Empire, where the dominant power is not seeking to impose either its politics or its economic policy on the countries with whom it is actually doing economic business. So this has made them a much more welcome and a much more long-term sustainable partner than the sort of traditional dominant powers going back again to the times of the Roman Empire, because all of them have sought political dominance, have sought political influence, in, uh, have then moved in from seeking influence to, uh, to colonization, and then neo-colonially, neo-colonization uh, co and in the contemporary world, the processes of neo-imperialism. These have all been integral to the uh, hegemonic process of countries. China, as far as I can see, people can have an argument with me on this if they have evidence to the contrary, but this is what I find is the distinctive feature about the Chinese. Does Mohsen want to say something? Yes, I want to have a question for you. Are you concerned about the environmental impact of the rush to development in the Bangladesh? Because I, and is there any any concern, any sincere concern in the government that what is the impact on the on the environment at all? On the environment, yes. If you people presumably get online newspapers, Arch Cave, you pick up to this morning's Daily Star. To me, to three four environmental political economy, they can bar go ekene. Politically influential people are, in fact, uh, grabbing forest lands and uh, excavating sand from it, which is creating a crisis in the forest sector. They are grabbing lands wherever they are. And because they are all political players. I mean, if you want to abuse the environment, you better have strong political backing. Otherwise, the market will go so this is an essential element of the nature of the uh, confrontation of, uh, you may say, sort of environmental <laughs> abuse, that you need to actually have the political authority to violate the, you rape the environment with impunity. Didn't you see plenty of evidence of this process? in which someone has uh, excavated a river, someone has then dug up hills, sort of hill disintegrate forest land in river because in fact the land has been encroached. Shop to bochor por bochor cholche. Because actually, because the dynamics of the marketplace are that land has become gold in Bangladesh. Right. Right. Land developers and political 
you will be left with no forest and no river. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you want to look at the Bobisha, <laughs> that will be the prospect you have to keep in yeah, mind. Yeah, unfortunately. Scary. Uh, don't know about I'm just sir, you to elude cool and I'm just data when a Chinese non ideological expansionism, if that's how we characterize it. Uh, apparently non ideological, holy or hot, but a deep seated at a process for the para leading to some, some, something. But anyway, say, debate in RJ, it are an example of the environmental destruction. Among Amito Prague, Madam, there must be no Gurea Slav. Among it is somewhat distressing to see that in most cases. It, it is Chinese construction companies yeah. who are actually <laughs> a, a carrying this destruction uh, process. For example, you know, Pushur Nodi, Pushur Nodi to dredge for to, uh, to rehabilitate the navigability of Monglapo. Abong Shita Korteje, we are converting the Pushur Nodi basin into kind of, you know, uh, so there is Arabia like desert. Yeah. It's incredible. All the dredged sand from the Pushur, and it is, and and for that China has brought in three most powerful dredgers in the entire world. Bangladesh technology to manage all encompassing piped cutter and suction, cutter and suction dredger. A shamas a dredger, a pipe de, a balita, baligulo, pushur no de tire fils. Tarjon of pushur no de jet a shundar boner kind of part. Shekhane kothai, you expect a kind of, you know, delta kind of landscape that is getting converted into sand dunes. And and the connection, the, the political economic connection is you know, uh, also another source of distress because a lot of a lot of people sensing sensing that you know because of this Monglapo, because of the Padda Shetu leading to try more you know <clears throat> business executed through Monglapo, they they are gobbling up uh, land uh, along this Poshu River and other rivers because they think you know this will become commercially uh, uh, more valuable and you know. And, and it was interesting, instructive to see some of, I won't name them, some of the signboards that have been put up along Poshu River with hundreds of acres claiming ownership over hundreds of acres of land are of senior bureaucrats. Yeah. Senior bureaucrats buying up those land in the name of their wives, you know, and, you know, coining very, very, um, a, a very uh, attractive, you know, kind of, you know, uh, uh, for, uh, naming, uh, putting up very uh, signboards with very uh, apparently pro-environment, like, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But basically it's all clear that this is pure commercial interest driving them. And then you can also probably speculate a connection between these, what is happening in terms of you know this uh, dredging and the eventual uh, 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 materialization of the commercial goal, because for those people they don't need a wet uh, environment along the Poshu River, they need this kind of sand. So the government is in a sense uh, 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 doing the development work that they intend to do. So they're just you know building sand dunes on which they can go there directly and build whatever they want, which may be totally in uh, harming the interest of the Sundarbans, harmful for Sundarbans. So it's, it, it is very, and, and this is just one example, how the you know, uh, knowingly or unknowingly, these construction companies are kind of, you know, uh, serving, both destroying the environment and serving the interest of, you know, what are prescribed as food. Uh, describe as crony, crony or whatever. So that's what is happening. You know, I, I, this is just an example because I, I saw it in other parts in other other constru construction projects, and it's it's uh, and you know you see them and you you 
you feel, you know, mm. because it's it's quite visual that you know these construction projects may not be the right ones for Bangladesh at this right stage of its development. You, know? you didn't you don't need eight lane highways to go to to go to some of the parts to which these highways are now being built. Well, anyway, so this one, my advice now is an interesting piece of research is that wherever you see a big project, find out who are the local partners. Yeah. And, and these are, are, wherever are, you will see a big Chinese project contractor, he will have his local counterpart. Yeah. Find out who they are, what their business and political antecedents are. Then you will get some understanding of the political economy. Right. That's why you know the whole country has become kind of a hunting ground for, for these large construction companies to just no, come. No. And, uh, that's the way it's going. It's all right. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Nasrul Bhai. Arak Jhunar Prashno had to learn. I mean, Namta was the one. I am taking to Puri Jodi. I am taking Namta. Bole, I am taking Prashno. Please. Uh, I am not please. জি আমার নাম রনি আমি বাংলার পাঠশালা থেকে বলছি সারের বক্তিতা এবং টোটাল আলো আরো যে সব আলোচনা হয়েছে সেটা আমি অনেক সমৃদ্ধ হয়েছে তো সারকে আমার একটা প্রশ্ন যে স্যার এই ইমার্জেন্স অফ বাংলাদেশের পিরিয়ডে ওই সময় স্যার কি কোনো আপনার লেখায় তো অনেকবারই এসছে যে সোশ্যাল জাস্টিস এর কথা জাস্টিস এর কথা তো ওই সময়ে কি স্যার মানে কোন কারণ আমরা জানি যে আটচল্লিশ সালে বা তারও আগে অনেকগুলো গুরুত্বপূর্ণ জাতিসংঘে অনেকগুলো গুরুত্বপূর্ণ ট্রিটিস হয়েছে হিউম্যান রাইটস এর উপরে পলিটিক্যাল সিভিল রাইটস এর উপরে তো গ্লোবাল জাস্টিস এর কথা যদি আমরা চিন্তা করি তাহলে কি স্যার আপনি যখন এই যে এক্সটার্নাল ডিপেন্ডেন্স এর ওই ইউএস কাউন্টার পার্ট বা আমাদের অন্যান্য কাউন্টার পার্টের সাথে আলাপ করছেন কথা বলছেন তো ওই সময়ে কি স্যার এই যে যে একটা স্পষ্ট একটা আনজাস্ট জিনিসটাকে ইম্পোজ করার বিরুদ্ধে যেমন আপনি স্যার রেজিস্ট করছেন উইথ ইউর নলেজ এন্ড অ্যানালিসিস কিন্তু এর বাইরে এর বাইরে কি কোন গ্লোবাল জাস্টিস এর কোন কিছু ছিল না যে যেটা বলতে পারে যে না এই নিগোসিয়েশন ইটস এ পাবলিক নিগোসিয়েশন এবং এইখানে জাস্টিসটা শুড বি মেনটেইন এবং পরবর্তীতে স্যার যখন আপনি ওই যে আফটার দ্য অ্যাসাসিনেশন অফ বঙ্গবন্ধু পরবর্তীতে যখন স্যার আপনি বললেন যে আপনি দেখতে পেলেন যে টোয়েন্টি পেজেস যখন আপনি কেয়ারটেকার গভর্নমেন্টে ছিলেন টোয়েন্টি পেজেস ক্লজেস দিয়ে দেওয়া হয়েছে যেগুলো একশো বছরেও বাংলাদেশ পূরণ করতে পারবে না তাহলে এই এই যে অনায্য একটা জিনিস যে চাপানো সেইখানে কি অন্য কোনো থার্ড কোনো বা কোনো স্পেস নেই যেখানে আমরা কি জাতিসংঘ বা কোনো যেখানে উই ক্যান ক্লেম দ্যাট যে আমাদের ইনজাস্টিস আমাদের উপর ইম্পোজ হচ্ছে যে এবং আমরা জাস্টিস এর ব্যাপারে কথা বলতে পারি আমাদের ভয়েস রেস করতে পারি আর আমার সেকেন্ড প্রশ্ন হচ্ছে যে স্যার আমাদের পলিসি ডিপেন্ডেন্সি এবং ইসের ক্ষেত্রে আমাদের এডুকেশন এডুকেশন স্যার আমাদের পলিসি ডিপেন্ডেন্সি বা আকাশ ভাই যেটা বললেন যে পলিসি ডিপেন্ডেন্সি এবং পলিসি ইম্পোর্টের ক্ষেত্রে আমাদের এইখানে কি আমাদের এইখানে কি নলেজের কোন ভূমিকা আছে যে যেটা আমাদের এই নিজের আত্মসম্মান এবং নিজের সেলফ ইয়ে ইকোনমিক সেলফ রিলায়েন্স এর পাশাপাশি আমাদের নলেজ রিলায়েন্স বা নলেজ ইন্ডিপেন্ডেন্সটা যেন আমাদের থাকে মর্যাদা যাতে থাকে did not appear in the 21st century. <laughs> so that is the simple answer to that. Kono aid agreement there, Shonge, justice shop do keo bebohar kore na. Eta ako nutun discourse e buddhe chole aste. Whether they believe in it or not, it or no bebohar. But alutuna eko no cha. Oisho moi, we may raise that issue, but people would laugh at you if you talk too much about justice. To what ye, second question ha chile ho, Uh, about uh, 
যে আমাদের নলেজ আমার তো প্রায় বিশ বছর চলে গেল ফ্রম দি মিড সেভেন্টেজ আপ টু আই থিঙ্ক অ্যাবাউট দি এন্ড অফ দি সমস্ত তোমার পলিসি এজেন্ডাস এন্ড পলিসি এডভাইস ওয়ার কামিং ফ্রম দি ডোনার্স এন্ড ডোনার কনসালটেন্টস আমি যখন শাহাবুদ্দিন সরকারে ছিলাম দ্যাট টাইম আই সেট আপ দিজ 29 task forces amar main uddeshyo chilo to prove to the bangladesh people ekon ki notun ekta democratic era asche that bangladesh had the professional expertise to prepare its own policies people had ceased to believe that bangladesh er bhitore policy capability chilo and shop consultant policy taiyar korbe so i got these people to prepare these task force reports the only person at that time who paid any attention to the task force reports was sheikh hasina as the leader of the opposition opposition sarkar er lok to west bengal basket e fele diyeche because they thought that eta ami awami league ponthi er lok to eta ekon ekta awami league conspiracy was being imposed on them to impose a wabidi policy agenda they shop to since oi sarkar ek to totally ek ta they operated on oshikito principle where they actually had no idea what they were talking about it kono gobishona kore nai ki ki rokom policy advocacy asche ke policy korche kar lok jukto ache but shudhu ek ta dhalao bhabe they would then make these observations so they never used it and actually cpd er bhi ei rokom obhigota ache i mean we went through this uh, business of bringing people together again to prepare policy agendas and uh, we saw the experience amar shob je lok ki aaj bar bar runi to tar por amar upore ek to birakto hoye jay that you are bringing us here to prepare these advice to me amake kono taka paisa dicho na shudhu biscuit or chocolate hoyche and we are taking so much time away to the kono advice for so that i don't know why are you doing this to me টেকনোলজিক্যাল এডভাইস ম ফর দি economic and business benefit of the project you are seeking advice to build up a policy agenda but we don't know better dhonnobad sir amar mone hoy amader shomoy o pray shesh sar kar kono proshno korte chai naki ami amar ekta chotto ekta proshno ache amra ei deshe environmental the destruction can we try to quantify how much we are losing as a result of result of certain environmental Uh, destruction for example is there any effort to do so because this should be counted as negative toward what you however you quantify growth and development for example if you are losing resources because of our development access that should be should be minus i think there is a way to quantify quantify these things in terms of some dollar values in it at least you know to, to give the sense that we are we are pro- talking about a lot of gain but in reality we probably losing quite a bit also, also. There are there are techniques that we uh, we use some of it in here. For example, the, if you lose a forest area, how much you losing as a result of result of the potential resources? For example, I think that is might be might be something to think about. Anyway, that's the suggestion. Yes, uh, this is there's a literature on that, and I'm sure Nazrul is very familiar with that. I don't know anything about the literature. I mean, the general principle that there is a computable cost for environmental depredation data literature are there so we should do something with that but as i said it's too late in the evening to go into that nazrul ye hat gaye sen apni kichu bolen unmute korte hobe ha eta thik onek raat hoye geche 11 ta baje sare we should round up so that it is 11 o'clock right yeah right. so, so yeah. 
just uh, in two, uh, one, one or two sentences. Yes, there is, it is necessary, and this has been on the agenda for quite some time about recomputing GDP, taking into account this particular <laughs> environmental infrastructure. And in, at the United Nations Statistical uh, Division, uh, a process has been going on for quite some time now to integrate the conventional GDP with environmental accounting. Right. And uh, it, it has reached a stage where it is uh, proposed for the, to the uh, member states to, to accept. As you know, the, system, the current system, system of national accounts that is practiced is, a, is, is something that even was developed at the UN. So, uh, it, it, the UN is also in the lead of integrating these two accounts, but it has to reach uh, a, a, a higher stage of kind of finesse before uh, it can be adopted. Uh, right, right. But We're running out of time, though. That's the problem. <laughs> ধন্যবাদ নজর ভাই ধন্যবাদ মনসিন ভাই আমার মনে হয় রাত অনেক হয়েছে বাংলাদেশেও এবং এখানেও দুপুর প্রায় একটা হয়ে গেছে আমরা দেড় ঘন্টা এই আলোচনা শেষ করব আশা করেছিলাম কিন্তু আমাদের এই আলোচনা এতই প্রাণবন্ত ছিল যে প্রায় দু ঘন্টায় আমাদের এই আলোচনাটা চলল যারা আলোচনাটা শুনেছেন তাদেরকে সবাইকে আমি ধন্যবাদ জানাতে চাই যারা ফেসবুকে বিশেষ করে আছেন ধৈর্য ধরে আলোচনা শুনছেন তাদেরকে ধন্যবাদ জানাতে চাই আর এখানেও যারা আছেন তাদেরকেও ধন্যবাদ জানাতে চাই সর্বোপরি আমি ধন্যবাদ জানাবো আজকে প্রফেসর রেহমান সোহানকে উনি অনেক রাত পর্যন্ত বসে আমাদের সাথে এই আলোচনাটা করলেন এবং বাংলাদেশের বর্তমান সিচুয়েশনে আমাদের করণীয়টা বললেন তো বিশেষ বিশেষ করে উনি যে কথার উপর জোর দিয়েছেন অ্যাট দ্য এন্ড অফ দ্য ডে ডেমোক্রাটাইজেশন অফ আমাদেরকে নিজের পায়ে দাঁড়াতে হলে অবশ্যই আমাদের আমাদের দেশের কথাটা ভাবতে হবে আমাদের ইকোনমিকে ডেমোক্রেটাইজ করতে হবে আমাদের রাজনীতিকেও ডেমোক্রেটাইজ করতে হবে এটাই হচ্ছে মূল কথা আর প্রধানের কথা আমি মহসিন ভাই আপনার যদি কিছু বলার থাকে আপনি বলে শেষ করতে পারেন অথবা আমি সবাইকে ধন্যবাদ সবাইকে ধন্যবাদ জানিয়ে আজকের এই অনুষ্ঠান শেষ করছি থ্যাংক ইউ ভেরি মাচ ফর বিং